In this week number 12 we are discussing tables. Let us take a look at a couple of example websites out there that are making use of tables. For example, when we are dealing with some sort of sport website or some sort of standings in general, most likely we would create a table on our website. Or when we are dealing with some sort of financial information or some sort of statistics, we would ultimately create a table. It completely depends on the project, the website that we are working on, whether we have a use for a table or not. However, there is one situation, irrespective of the website project that we are working on, where we would always make use of tables. And that is the case when we make our websites dynamic by using two more languages that we will be discussing in this course, MySQL and PHP. So what is coming now in the next couple of minutes is just for us to get a feeling where we are heading in this course. Nothing to understand right now. What I have here is a simple restaurant website and right now I'm under the food menu. And here are the top categories of that food menu, pizza, salad, alcoholic drinks, etc. And all this data here, the top categories of this menu as well as anything else on this website, the entire content is completely drawn from databases. Databases are just tables, nothing else. Here are tables and among those tables there is one table which I have given the name top categories, which are the top categories of that food menu and here each row represents ultimately one item that is right being displayed on the actual food menu website right here. So there is salads, pizza, etc. And all that data is coming from here and what we ultimately all need to do is we create one single box in HTML by using, for example, a div element. So we create this box and then we give it in CSS, we give it its appearance, how it shall appear in terms of background, in terms of margin padding and all these settings that we can apply on this box and how we want that one to look. And then with MySQL, we are retrieving the rows inside this table. And with PHP, we can then dynamically create that HTML for each row that's being returned from the database. Now create me one of those boxes of which we have only created one. And therefore all other boxes will be created dynamically. It's not the case that we need to write that code for it. That code, HTML code, the div elements will be written dynamically. Therefore, we do not need to write that much code ultimately anymore. It will be done in a dynamic way. And what will be inserted in, into these boxes is always then the, in this case, the name, the English name that's listed right in, inside this row. This is where we are heading towards in this course. And it's not the case that we would go into the database if we had any changes to do on those items in, in this case. It's not that we would modify them right in here or delete an item or add a new item in here, even though it wouldn't, would not be a problem to do so. However, there is a more efficient way in doing such things. And that is what we will do is we create a second website, a so-called backend website or content management system, CMS. Nothing to remember right now. The actual website is so, is the so-called front end. And this is the back end, which is just a private area in, by, by which we can then modify, <coughs> modify the actual content inside the database. And here is the table with the top categories of that food menu. And it's not just the food menu here. Let me actually go into another table here. For example, are the opening hours, which are displayed on the left side of, of this website. The entire content comes from tables and inside this back end website which is private by which we need to log in. So we will be building a login system ultimately here for us or for our client who we create the website for. And the content can be very easily be modified, edited and deleted right in here. All we are creating here are tables. We are replicating the database tables right in here. Again, in a dynamic way, all we need to do is create one single row and then in HTML, this is what we are discussing in this week, how to create table rows and tables in general. And then for each row in the database, hey, create me one of those rows. Everything will be dynamic once again, also here in the backend system. 
And this is where we therefore always make use of tables, because here we are replicating the database tables. It's just a copy of the database, nothing else. And for example, let me also go here into the opening hours. Here's just the table. Let's also inside here under context in this case, it's just a replication of this table by which we can then much more easily change and modify that content. Let me go into an example and let me just um, activate or deactivate in this, in this case the, the pizza menu and let me add a new item right in here. And as soon as I click save, now we are having, we have just done modified the database. So let me refresh here and here we can see the pizza has now been deactivated. It has been set to zero and the new item is now being displayed in here. And since our entire content right in the back end is just a replication of the database, now this table here is updated as well. The new item has been inserted here and the pizza has been deactivated as well right here. And since the front end of the website is also drawing the entire content from the database, which we have just modified, therefore as soon as I reload the page, the pizza top menu item is gone and our new item has been inserted in the database and therefore it's also being displayed on our actual website as well. This is where we are heading towards in this course, just for us to get a feeling towards it, nothing to, to understand completely right now, since all I wanted to bring across is that we are always making use of tables here, irrespective of what website we are building, since modern websites are created in such a dynamic way where the content comes from databases, from tables, and here we are always creating tables, we are replicating the database tables. And this is really irrespective of whether we are dealing with a small blog, a small business website, or a very large website such as Amazon or Facebook, all these modern websites are created in such a dynamic way by drawing these things from databases. Let us now start into this week in which we are discussing the tables, how to create them in HTML. And that will be our first part in this week. We will take a look at the HTML elements that are in use here when we create the tables. And those elements, among those elements is the table element, which is just the container box for the table itself. Excel, in Excel we always create tables, so the container box in this case would be the table element would be used, that's the container box for the entire table. And then we are creating the table row by row, one row after the other using the TR element, table row element. And all the table and the table rows are, as we can see here, once again we are just dealing with boxes, nothing else. Websites are all about boxes. It's all completely all about boxes. And inside these rows, once again, there are individual boxes or so-called cells that we refer to them as we most likely are familiar with from Excel. And once again, these are just boxes and those ones we are then creating by using either the TH or the TD element. Table header cells and table data cells. So when we are creating a row with headlines or when we are dealing with a headline here that represents in this case, for example, the column in, in here, then we are using the TH element. And for the actual data, then we are using the TD element. So all we are doing here once again is giving meaning to our content by using those meaningful elements. And we will find out that we could, of course, since we are only dealing with boxes, we could, of course, create tables by using the diff element but we should always go for the meaningful alternatives. And there are other advantages here as well, which we are discussing later on. Whatever belongs together, as recommended already a couple of times, shall be wrapped inside its own element in its own container box. Since we then have control over that area, what we always do in CSS, we select our elements. And if there is an element that represents a section that belongs together, then we have control over that section. So very important to always do this and very much recommended. And this is also the case when we are dealing with tables. Tables can be divided up into at least two areas that belong together, sometimes also three. And the first area is the head of the table. And the second wrapper, the second um, section is the entire body, 
the main part of the table. And if we are dealing with a financial table, for example, then we are also most likely having a foot of the table, the footer section, in which, for example, the sum, the total is being displayed in case, for example, let's just assume that here would be, for example, a dollar or euro amount. And here as well, all these would be uh, digital data in, in, in euros or in dollars, for example. And ultimately, the last row would be the total, the sum, and that would be the foot of the website, the total. And for those sections of the table, we do not need to fall back to the div element either here, since we also have meaningful container boxes for those sections. Here is the T head, the T foot, and the T body elements. And then we have the caption, which is just another word for the title of the table, which will be the title then. And finally, there are two more elements, which are giving us the control over the individual columns. Since we are creating always the tables row by row using the TR element, meaning that there is not really an element that represents a column. And since there is no element representing a column, the people at the W3C came up with two other elements that give us the control over the columns. Since the columns also are a section that belongs together um, of which we want to have control over. So indirectly kind of we do have control even though there is no element wrapping a, a column. We do have control by using the call group and the call element. This is the first part of this week. Those elements we will be discussing. And then we are marching on into the second section of this week. There are a couple of properties right here that can only be given to tables. Those ones we are then discussing in the second section of this week. And then finally, we will take a look at the display property. We will find out during this course that all these boxes that we are creating when we are dealing with those elements, all these boxes are behaving in a certain way. For example, let me just pull out one example now. If I would now increase the content that is inside this cell. Now this height of this box, this cell is just a box. This one would increase, but not only this one. Also all its sibling boxes would increase. So this is a situation or this is an, an example that would not be the case if we are dealing with our values that we have so far gotten familiar with for the display property display block, display inline block, for example. Those two boxes are next to each other. We have given them display inline block. And if I would now increase the height of this second box, it's not the case that its sibling box, this one here, would also increase in height. So there are certain behaviors going on and this was just one example. And we will find out that it is actually the, those table that display features that display values that are used on table cells, for example, that they have quite some usage or they can have usage also when we are not dealing with tables. For example, let's take a look at our box right here, the navigation box. This one ends right here. And the box that's next to it, the light blue one, goes all the way down. Wouldn't it be nice if also this box would go all the way down? And this is what we can achieve by using, for example, display table cell. So we can make those two boxes, which we have created just by using other container boxes. This one is the aside element we have used here. And this one is just a div element. And if we make, we can make those two boxes behave like a table cell by changing them to display table cell in instead of using display inline block. And therefore we can kind of create also parts of the layout for our website by using those display properties. So this is the final section of this week that we will be taking a look at. And first of all, now we will start by creating the table in the first place using the HTML elements that we have here that we can use for tables. So let us get started. Get, let us get into the code now. And first of all, let's create the container box for our table. And inside here, we are creating the table row by row using the table row elements. And in here are either TH or TD boxes, cells. And depending on whether we are dealing with a headline or whether we are dealing with a data cell, data box. It's just a meaningful, they're both the same. They are just meaningful boxes ultimately, whether it's a headline or an actual data. 
and most likely our first row inside our table would be a header cell. So let's let me also go for headlines here and let me write something in here subheadline for the reason because we will be discussing and we will be also creating a row later on with top headlines for our table. Let me copy and paste a couple of those over. So what we have now is a table container box with one row in which there are four cells and these ones are header cells headlines. Here one row with four individual cells. Let's create another row and this row shall then consist in this case in our example now of TD elements. So now we are going for the actual data that belongs under each of these headlines. And let me write just something in here for example data cell and let me also copy and paste four of them over. Of course four of them because if I only went for three of those cells then there would only be three cells and the last the second row, the last cell, then there would be no cell. So of course we would also go in this case for four cells. Let me copy and paste a couple of those rows over so we have a little bit more data to work with. And let me make the last row with those cells. Those ones shall be the total. So let us assume that we are dealing with some sort of financial data here. This would be a certain digital amount of euros or, or dollars. This one as well, this two, this two. And here ultimately is then the total amount of all these values in the other cells in that column. So therefore, let me, we are still making use of the TD element. However, all I'm changing now is the content in here. So we have um, a differentiation here that the last row shall actually be the total. We are not restricted in just using TD elements inside a table row or inside another row just to use TH elements. We can also mix things up like it is the case on all the example websites that we have actually taken, taken a look at. For example right here all these cells in the first row are table header cells. These are the headlines for the individual columns inside this table. And then underneath the first row, there are the, pre the preceding rows and e always the first cell is also a headline. It's the headline for the row. So this one would also be a TH element. The, the actual data is starting right here. All these boxes right here would be TD elements. This one is still a TH element. Same right here when we are dealing in this case in, in those statistics with those um, countries. Once again, these are TH elements. The actual data starts right here. Those ones we would create using the TD element. So we can mix things up and this is exactly what I'm now doing. I'm also changing the first cell in each row to a table header cell. And let me just also change the content that is inside it. And let me copy and paste the first. Let me also make all the coming the other rows let me make the first cell to be a table header cell. And the, the difference here between TD and TH is really just meaning, nothing else. The browser by default gives the TH element a, a couple of default appearances. So here we can see that the TH elements are by default set in the browser default style sheet that the browser is using. It sets it to font weight bold and also in the total here we can see it, it's text aligned to the center inside this box. But these are just CSS settings that we could also apply to TD elements. These are just default settings since most likely our headlines will be bolded. So this is just what the browser already does in case it is, we also wanted to have it this way which is likely and therefore we don't need to change it anymore. So this are these are just default behaviors that the browser is already applying. The real point here is that we are dealing with meaning once again. And this is what we want to once again completely understand in this week that these are just elements ultimately. How they behave, how they appear on the website is all done in CSS. This is just marking up our, our content on the website with meaningful elements. And some of them can have specific attributes which we will see later on. This is then also something to consider. But ultimately how things behave and how things appear is all CSS. So now we have mixed things up 
and whatever belongs together should always be wrapped inside its own container box and this is what we are now concentrating on inside our table this is the head of the table this is the body of the table and this is the foot of the table and we have those meaningful container boxes here for already they do exist we don't need to use the diff element and the one is the t head the table head element a container box that represents the head of the table in which i am now cutting and pasting our first row the second container box is the table body which is the greatest part of our table most of the rows go in here all of, of the remaining ones apart from the total those ones go into the body element and finally our total if we are dealing for example with a financial table then we also have a foot on our website and here goes now the row with the total goes inside here and those container boxes let's go into an example we should always create since we then have control over the entire section and it will therefore makes it make it much easier for us in css to select these sections that belong together and this is what we now want to take a look at so let me target for example the table head meaning only our header section here only the th elements that are inside the t head and this is now much easier because otherwise, for example, we would have needed to go for the table element, for example, and then select all th. But that would also refer then to those th elements. So here, once again, we can see it's always very recommended to create a container box of a section that belongs together so that we then have control in CSS over that area. So I now want to create, uh, want to select all the descendants of the t head element that are th elements the descendants th since this is the t head the children are the is the tr element and the grandchildren therefore the descendant is the th and this is done once again by using just a white space the child selector would be this one this is the descendant selector and now let me give those th elements inside the table header section of the table let me give those a background color of gray and here they are gray and let me also go for the t body and let me select the descendants th descendants right there and also for the t foot let me select the th descendants right there and let me give those ones a background color of uh, light gray and here once again just for us to to see once again it's always important to whatever belongs together should be should have its own container box so that we have it much so it's much easier for us to have control over a section that belongs together so this is uh, the t foot the t body and the t head and the t foot can also be after the table head and before the table body so let me take the t table foot out and insert it right after the table head. Now, according to the rules of the normal flow that we have gotten familiar with over the last two weeks, the normal flow always tells us where our code is inside our HTML file. This is the order in which that code, which that content will be displayed on our website. And since the table foot is now before the table body, the row with the totals that would mean according to the normal flow rule that this total row would should should then be displayed right here let me reload the page and this is not the case let me take the table head even though this one we shouldn't do however it can be done and let me bring it after the table body let me reload the page the table head with the sub headlines nevertheless it's not at the end of the table this row it's still at the head of the table so there is a certain behavior going on for those elements and this is all defined ultimately what we are taking a look at in the third section of this week in the display property how those elements are behaving so there is completely a certain behavior going on in regards to those elements and the table foot why we just go over this example here is the reason because it can be before the table body even though it, it will ultimately still be displayed at the end of the table. And the reason is, if we are having a, 
a large table body, meaning if we are dealing with a large table that has many, many rows, that means that maybe the table may take a while to load the table body. And if a person in particular, when that one is having a not that decent internet connection, then he needs to wait until the T-body has been loaded, all the, the many rows that are inside there. But maybe, and it can be the case, that the person is just taking a look at our table in order to see the result, the total, which is maybe the most important information to that person. And therefore, even though the table body may take a while to load, then the table foot is already being displayed. And that is the idea behind it, why the table foot not necessarily but can be before the table body so that this person already can view the total without having to wait for the table body to load for all the many rows that are inside here. That's the reason behind it. And the same reason is applied to the caption which is now our next element and the caption is just another word for title and that is the title for our table. Let me write here table with table elements, elements and that title must always be that caption element. The first must always be in the first child inside the table for the same reason. Now sometimes, most likely we have seen it somewhere already, that titles are also sometimes displayed at the bottom of the table. And we can bring this caption to the bottom. However, we can not move this caption, we cannot take it out and move it to the bottom, even though we could, of course, but it's not allowed since the caption shall always be the first child of the table for the exact same reason, in case the body takes too long to load, so that person can already see the title, so that person knows what that table is about. Same reason with the table foot, exactly same applies to the table caption. This element must always be the first child inside the table element. And this caption we can bring then to the bottom by using a CSS property, which we are discussing now in a couple of minutes in the second section of this week. Let's complete our elements. We have two more to discuss. And those two elements that we are now going over, they are referring to the columns of our table. Since we are creating our tables always row by row, there is no element that represents a column. And columns, nevertheless, they also belong together somehow. And we should have control either of all the columns or of the columns individually so that we, for example, can give each column a certain width or a certain background color, for example. And therefore, because we are creating our table always row by row, and since there is no table column element that represents an entire column section, therefore the W3C came up with two other elements, and one of which is the call group element, which gives us the control over the columns in a common way. We can give the, the columns a common appearance. And what that means in detail, we take a look uh, right now First of all, this element has one specific attribute that can be applied on it, and that is the span attribute. Here, with that value that we are using in here, we define how many columns do we want to span over, do we want to select, basically. For example, let me go for two, for the number two. So we are now selecting column number one and column number two, the first two columns of our table. Let me give this one a class name, even though right now we not necessarily needed to use a class name since the call group element when we are dealing with only one table, we could also select it by, by its type. However, I've, I've given it now a class name for the reason that comes now in a second. So let me select now the call group element by its class name and let me now define a background color, for example, of yellow and we are now referring to column number one and column number two, to two, to the first two columns. And those ones will now receive a background color of yellow. However, as we can see here, the second column is having the background color of yellow. However, not really the entire column, since the subheadline also belongs to that column. But this one didn't get the, didn't receive the background color of yellow. And the first column entire, in the entire first column didn't receive the background color of yellow neither. 
And this is because whatever we define in CSS that shall be applied on the call group will always be overwritten when we are selecting TH or TD elements, which we have already done. We have made the headline here, the header part, a gray background we have given it and the first cell here, the row headlines, we have given a light gray background. Now, can we remember what specificity is, which we have discussed in week number six? We have discussed that specificity is referring to the selection here. The more specific we do the selection, then this will be taken ultimately. This one will override a selection that is less specific. And we have gone over a point system by which we can, it may, it may make it easier for us to, to, to always know what is more specific than something else. And elements by type, when we select them by type, as it is the case right here, we are selecting the elements itself, receive one point. And here we have one point and here we have one point. Ultimately, the total here is two points. And when we are selecting by class, this one is 10 points. So this would mean that yellow should actually override light gray and gray in this case. And this is not the case. So this is something, a situation where specificity is not really, really um, um, being applied right here. And the reason is coming in a moment. Let us first introduce now our next element. Since we, with the call group element, we can change the span number here to three, for example, then the third column will be affected or we change it to four. Then the first four columns will be affected if they are not overwritten by anything else. But there is no control that we have over individual columns. If, for example, we want to only have those, the column two and three to have a background color of yellow, but we want the last column to have a background color of orange or a certain width, this one shall have a certain width, while the other two shall have a different width. So there is no chance that we have by using the call group element that gives us control over the columns individually, only in a common way. And therefore there is another element that can be a child of the call group element and should always be the child of the call group element, even though actually it can also be used without the call group but it should always be the child nevertheless, since that is also the reason why call group is ending in the first place, since it has this content of the call elements. And these call elements also have the span attribute by which we are defining how many columns do we want to span over, how many columns do we want to select. So let me just give this one, I want to select the first column, and now I'm using a class name, let me give it a class name here as well, of um, call one, and this call element, we can use multiple times. And then the first call element in this case will represent column number one because we have specified number one here. If I change now the, the value for the span attribute inside the second call element, this one represents column two and three in this case. Since the first one is already taken, that is column number one, then we want the next two columns, which is column number two and three, and this one will represent column number four. Let me also change the class values in this case for a moment. We are um, targeting those by class names. And whenever we make use of the call element, something is wrong here. As we can see, NetBeans still underlines us our elements in red. Since once we make use of the call element inside the call group, then we cannot make use of the span attribute inside call group anymore. Isn't that a behavior? Doesn't that sound familiar to us already? Isn't that something that we have already seen some of those features that are exactly the same? And we do with the video and with the audio element. Both of these elements have the source attribute that can be given to, to, to them. And with the source attribute, we are defining the value defines the path to the server where the video or where the audio is located. And sometimes it happens that we want to define multiple sources to the server, since there are maybe multiple videos or the same video in a different format for the reason that we have discussed. Sometimes we want to, we have the same video in different formats, since one is lower, uh, is um, t tinier in file size, while the other one is accepted by all the browsers. 
However, there is only one source attribute, so how can we define multiple paths to the server? Since there is only one source attribute, and this is why we have the source element. It's a child of a video and audio, and this source element we can use multiple times. This source element also has the source attribute, and when we make use of the source element multiple times, we can define multiple times a source to a path to the server to maybe the same video with a different file format. And once we make use of the source element with the source attribute inside video and audio, then we cannot make use of the source attribute for video and audio anymore. So this is exactly the same behavior that is going on with call group and call together, exactly the same behavior that takes place here. And now we have control over the columns individually. So let me target now, let me take this background color of yellow, the call group we are not making use of anymore. Instead, we are using the call elements now. And let me make the columns number two and three yellow and the last column shall, for example, be orange. And uh, let me reload the page. Here we can see this is the alternative. This is the option that we have to have control over the columns individually and not in a common way, which the call group only allows us. Now comes a limitation that the call group and the call element have. And that is that both of them are limited in what properties we can set on the columns. And that is, we are limited to background color, to width, to visibility, and to border. Those four properties we can define for the columns to have, but these are the only ones. I haven't read the, the reasoning behind it anywhere. However, my assumption is, and I'm pretty sure that this is the case. Since call group and call elements are not really a container box that represent a column. This is just an alternative since we are creating our table row by row. So there is a certain feature going on which once again is defined by the display property which we will take a look later. So there is a feature going on that indirectly kind of lets us select the columns even though there is no element that wraps a column uh, inside. So there is a certain feature going on and my assumption is that browsers in because there is a this feature is going on that browsers need to write additional quite additional code if they want to support the properties on uh, uh, for for the columns so that is uh, my assumption why this is the case why we are limited in what properties that we can use since browser is a software and software is just written in code and if there is not really an element that represents a column there must be additional code in order to achieve this behavior. And therefore, each property probably has its own code in order that it then is supported, that it can then be used. And if they would support then all the properties that exist out there, all of them basically, then there would be so much more code to write in order to make that functionality. So that is my assumption why we are limited here to background, to border, to width and to visibility, which most likely are the most important things, the most important properties that can be applied on a table. So meaning if I would now go for a color, for example, and define for the last column that we have given a orange background, that the color shall be white of the text, this one will not work. And why is it actually the case that visibility is one of those four properties that is allowed? Is that really an important one to be used? And this is the case because there is one more value for visibility that we haven't yet discussed. And that value is the value of collapse. And that value for the visibility property can only be given when we are dealing with tables, with table rows and columns, and never else. This one is specifically used for tables. And what it does, it collapses that column, it makes it disappear, and it does not take up any space in the, on the website. So if there was now another column right here, it would take its spot. Let me actually apply this one on columns two and three so we can actually see it. So this fourth column has now taken the spot that column number two and column number three um, have left since we have set visibility to collapse which just means collapse, remove it, kind of the same as display none. 
this is what's going on here, a value that can only be used on tables and most likely we would only make use of it in a dynamic way. For example, if we had a button here that says, hey, remove column, and then once we click it, the column will be gone. And once we click it again, then the column appears again. Something that we can also do in Excel. For example, I could now remove this column in case there are many columns and there, and this is one that I do not want to, uh, that I'm not interested in the information that's inside here so that the table becomes more overviewable. So this is why visibility collapse exists and can only be used for tables. And this is the reason why this is one of those four properties that can be given to the call group and the call elements. However, what happens now if we really wanted to have a column, to have a color of white, that we want that text to be in white, or we want it to have any other certain, certain CSS feature, and this we can do by using pseudo selectors. Pseudo selectors we haven't yet seen. The, those ones we will be introducing next week. And we actually do have control over the individual columns by using those pseudo, some of those pseudo selectors. Therefore, using the call group element, the call group element and the call element is nowadays actually not necessary anymore. Once we are selecting the columns by the pseudo selectors, which we are introducing at the very beginning of next week, then we can define anything that we want. Any CSS property can be given once we select the columns by using some of those pseudo selectors. And those pseudo selectors were not supported in Internet Explorer 7 and some of them not even in Internet Explorer 9, which version is not that long ago. In this course and nowadays for us, all we are doing in this course, we support Internet Explorer 11 onwards and the Edge browser and all the other ones. So we don't need to worry about it anymore. However, back a couple of years only back, there was no option in order to select columns in Internet Explorer. If a person visited our website used and used an Internet Explorer version of 7 or 6 or 8, then the columns may not be selected since it's not supported. And therefore people had to use the call group or the call elements. So those ones are more and more becoming kind of historic. Nowadays, not necessarily we need to use them anymore. But they do exist and they are still in use out there if we are taking a look at websites that have been created a couple of years back, for example, not that long ago really, then those ones had to be used in order to define the 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 column the column uh, the column uh, to select the columns unless alternatively of course what we could also do we could define a class for each and every cell so this one is possible as well however rather those ones are rather already historic nevertheless we have just gone over them how we can select columns by using pseudo selectors we are discussing immediately at the beginning of next week so these are our elements and there is now a little bit more to discuss here in regards in our first section in regards to the HTML since there are a couple of attributes that we can apply in particular or all of them referring to the TH and the TD element. First of all before we go into those properties let me create another row here. A row that shall represent the top headlines. For example this first column here shall not have any top headline. I don't want it to have any. Now the second column here, this subheadline and this subheadline shall share one headline together. For example, if this was about apples, this about oranges, then the top headline for both of them would, for example, be fruits. And I also want a top headline on the last column as well. So what I'm now doing is, once again, I'm creating TH, table header cells, and those table header cells, what I'm writing, just writing in here, is um, top headline. Now the first cell, however, I don't want it, the first column, I don't want it to have any headline. So I just leave it empty. Now the second one shall have a headline. However, it shall also share this headline with the third column. And the last column shall have its own headline once again. So therefore, I'm only creating now three cells instead of four since the second cell shall span over two columns and the attribute that's in use here that allows us to do so is the call span 
column span attribute and once again all we need to do is define a number how how many columns do we want that cell to span over so let me go for the number of two and here we can see this cell is now spanning over two columns and this attribute can only be given to th and td also the coming attributes that we are discussing among there is also a row span so we can also tell the browser hey this cell here shall span over another row this shall be the information not only for this row but also for the coming row that's underneath it for that cell and therefore we can also use a row span so let me target the last cell of the first row inside the table body and this one I will now be giving the attribute row span and once again let me make use of the value of two it shall span over two rows if I now reload the page there is a it's spanning over already however I now need of course I need to remove the cell in the preceding row since this one is not needed anymore it's occupied by the last cell of the first row already so therefore this text will is now displayed once I I reload the page now it's gone another value that we can make use here that might be interesting is the value of zero and this means we are telling here by the browser hey span over all the rows inside in regards to the parents so it will now occupy all rows right here but not the total and not the subheadline always in respect to the parent in this case the table body so once I reload the page here we can see it's spanning all over once we make use of the value of zero and of course now we need to remove the last cell in each row of the table body so that the text is not being displayed here since uh, this one is not needed anymore let me however go back to the value of two now the coming two attributes that are left that we haven't yet seen in this in this course they are very specific for sight disabled people and nevertheless it's not a big deal and not a difficult thing to understand and we should make use of those attributes because then we can provide a very helpful helpful thing for sight disabled people let's just assume that we were sight disabled for a moment and we are visiting this website we are using a so-called screen reader which is just a voice talking to us and that one can always tell us when we are jumping around by using the keyboard and we have jumped around and we are now right now for example inside this cell here and this voice the screen reader can then tell us hey this cell what's first of all what's inside this cell 101 and if we associate this cell with the head top headlines to which this cell belongs to then sight disabled people I have the information because right now if we do not associate the cell with the headlines the column headline and the row headline now what does that mean 101 which team does that 101 belong to and 101 of what is that most likely if we are familiar with the pointing system then most likely is the point but it's not always the case so therefore we should associate our cells with the according headlines to which this the the, the cell belonged belong to ultimately of course it will be a big job to do if we associate now each and every cell with the headline if we are making a table that is created in a non-dynamic way but ultimately <coughs> sorry and where we are heading in this course we will always create our tables dynamic and therefore we will, we will draw the content from databases all we need to do ultimately is create one row and then we say with PHP for each row in the database create one row with those table header cells nothing else so in a dynamic situation that it wouldn't be a big job to do and we are very much recommended of course to do it so that site disabled people really have enjoy visiting our website and now let's go actually into those attributes of which one of them is the headers attribute and the other one we are already familiar with let me now associate this subheadline cell with this top headline here so this subheadline is a sub cell of this top headline it belongs to that top headline and therefore the top headline i will now be giving an identity with the value however whatever this top headline is about for example fruits so let me just go for this example here if this headline was about fruits and now the subcell that's underneath it that one belongs to that 
top headline. And here we are using the headers attribute with the exact value that we have given to that identity. And the identity, of course, still must always be unique. So if we give now another header cell, we cannot use fruits anymore. But usually, most likely, it's the case that the headlines are, are not duplicated. They are not all about fruits. This one may be about fruits. This, this one may be about vegetables. So the other identity would be vegetables that we would use right here. And then here, once again, we would go then for headers. And then here, let me just write veggies and uh, this one is misspelled headers so this one i would give then an identity of wedgies for example so whatever of course our table is about let me now go into a cell here and this cell is a subheadline is a cell that belongs to this subheadline here so let me also in this case let me give the subheadline the this one here an identity and let me just call it now in this case x y just randomly let me call it this way i think that one i have already used let me call it x x x y and now this cell that total here that belongs to that subheadline i once again use the headers attribute with that value of the top headline this cell however not only belongs to a subheadline but also to a row headline and therefore, let me also give the row headline now an identity of, for example, <coughs> row H, whatever that ultimately that headline is about. And here we can use multiple values for the headers attribute by just separating them by comma. So this total cell here is now associated. It belongs to this subheadline and it belongs to this row headline. One more value by which we can make a good service provide a good service for site disabled people is also to define on the header cells and this is one attribute that can only be given to th elements since it only refers to the two t table header cells is that a headline for a column or is it a headline for a row because sometimes it's not always clear this one is a headline for a column however this one is one for a row even though it's always the first cell in each row so it's not always clear to site disabled people and whether this is a headline for a row or for a column. So therefore, the, the attribute scope at exists as well. In this case, this is a headline for a column and the value therefore is call. And if it is a headline for a row, then the value is row. And two more values actually also exist and that is a row group and call group. And this, those values we would be using if this headline here for this row would be a headline not for the entire row. For example, only for the first cell. And then right here there would might maybe would be another headline referring to the remaining rows that are coming right here. And then we would go for row group or call group in the same scenario when we have another column headline in the middle of the table. So those two values do also exist if we want to sort the table which most of the table tables allow us to do so so in this case we can sort these these tables and uh, the, the the columns and this one cannot be done without using going into javascript clicking the headline and then sorting the table so we need something we need another language before we can go into this one Something that the W3C already came out with, however, it is not supported by any of the browsers. And that is the value sortable that can be given to the table element. And once this one is applied, then the headlines will be sortable. However, this one is not yet supported and it will still take a while, a couple of years, until that one is first of all supported by the browsers. And also secondly, until the older browsers have died out so that everybody can make use of the table in a same way in uh, in that way so it still takes a while nevertheless i wanted to briefly mention that uh, this is something on the horizon that uh, may be useful in the future to be used these are now all our elements and attributes one more comment i want to make now before we go on into our second section of this week is the the ordering that's going on here so the caption must always be the first child of the table for the reason discussed the call group always must come before the table head same thing here an inside table head t foot and table body must always be the table rows immediately 
And then inside the table rows are either th or td elements. Whatever ultimately comes he in here is completely up to us. Right now, all we have made use of is text. We could also go for div elements here. We could also go for an image element. We could also go for another table element in here. So things, something that we will take a look at later on, but everything is basically, almost everything is allowed inside a th or inside a td element. As for example, we can also see right here in this cell, there is an image being displayed. Everything is allowed to, to be inside th or inside td elements. Now let's go into our second part and here we have a couple of settings and all of these properties here, all of these settings, they are given to the table element or to the table in general. In our case, the table element and all of them, most of them are referring to the, to the actual table cells. However, they are then in, um, inherited down from the table, even though they get applied on, on the table element. They will then be inherited by all the th and td elements, by all the cells, which, which cells are comprised either by th or td elements. So those ones, there is in, inheritance going on for the reason that we do not need to duplicate our code, even though we could actually also easily target the th and td elements and give them certain specifications wouldn't be a problem as well. However, they went for inheritance here. Now caption side is also inherited and the reason for this is because caption shall always be the first child of the table. So even though if we want that caption to be at the bottom of the table, we cannot take this element out here and move it inserted after the table body. For the reason discussed, if the table body is very large, then it may take a while to load and that the person already knows what this table is about. Therefore caption shall and must always be the first child and what's done here in order to get this caption to the bottom, we are making use of the caption side, applying it on the table element so that the browser knows where the end of the table is and then it can move the caption down to the bottom. So there is inheritance going on for a completely different reason as, as usual. So the usual reasons are for us to not having to duplicate any code or that we cannot target any text and therefore inheritance is going on. So we apply the settings, the pr properties on the parent and then the text inside that element will get these settings such as the space in between the text, letters, etc. And caption side is completely its own behavior that goes on here for that reason here. And uh, nevertheless, we can move it to the bottom therefore by using empty cells. The value that's being used here by default is the value of show. <laughs> Rubbish, sorry. Empty cells, I, I'm going for the wrong property right now. Caption side, the value that's being used here is top, meaning the headline, the caption will be at the top. That is the default value that's being in use and the alternative value that we can use is the value of bottom. Once we reload the page, the table caption is now at the bottom, even though it's still the very first element and according to normal flow rules, this one should be listed at the top. So it's going against its own behavior is going on here. Let's go for the next one and that is border spacing, which is the space in between the individual cells. And by default, there is already a space, as we can see, in between all the cells, which we can remedy, we can set it to zero, so that space will ultimately be gone. And we can also, of course, increase, for example, to 20 pixel. Now there is a 20 pixel gap in between the individual cells. And we also have control over vertical cells and horizontal cells individually by using two values here. While the first value represents horizontal, the horizontal gap in between the cells and the second value represents the vertical gap in between the cells. And here we can see horizontally we have now 20 pixel gap and vertically a 10 pixel gap in between the cells. And one comment I want to make here. There are quite a, num <coughs> quite a number of situations. <coughs> Sorry in which we are dealing with two values. For example, when we are dealing with text shadow, when we are dealing with border image slice, when we are dealing with box shadow, when we are dealing with background position, where we can also use two values. And in those situations, always the first value always refers to horizontal. The second is always the vertical value. 
and there is a little bit of inconsistency going on in CSS. Padding and margin are the only exceptions here. So if I would now go for 20 pixel, 10 pixel here, then the first value is referring to vertical and the second one is horizontal. So for padding and margin, it's the opposite. But otherwise, the first value is always horizontal and the second value is always vertical unless for padding and margin. So this is the pattern, <coughs> the pattern that is going on here in CSS. A little bit of inconsistency is uh, being applied here. And that is border spacing. And the next one that we are going over is empty cells. The default value that's being used here is show. And there is only one cell that we have here that's being empty. And the other value that we can make use of is hide. And now this cell will be hidden. Once again, like all the other properties that we are going over right now, are all applied on the table element itself. All are applied on the table and will be inherited down to the cells. And uh, then they, in this case, they will be hidden when they are empty. Now comes the next one and that is a border collapse. And before we make use of this one, let me first of all, let me change the border spacing to zero, bring them all together, those individual cells, and let me give each cell a border. So the cells are comprised of TD and TH elements, and those ones I will now give a border of one pixel solid, solid in black. And here we can see now that there is a at some points where adjacent cells meet each other, of course, there will be now a two pixel border. And on the outer parts where there is no adjacent cell next to it, there is of course only one pixel border. Since there is one pixel border on the right of this cell and a one pixel border in black on the left of this cell causing there to be two pixel. And that of course does not look good. And this is, of, and this is exactly what border collapse does or what we can do here, by default, the borders are being separated. The value that's being used here is separate and the other that we can use is collapse. And here we are telling the browser, hey, collapse those borders into each other. So we do always have one pixel for, or always have whatever we ultimately define here and that there is not a twice as much width of a border wherever adjacent cell are uh, meeting each other. So we are collapsing the borders into each other. And this, since we are collapsing the borders, the cells basically into each other, this is therefore the opposite of border spacing, kind of. So if we make use of border spacing now, hey, make a space in between the cells, this one will not work anymore since border collapse is overwriting now border spacing since it comes later, it's listed later on. And therefore it will override border spacing. Also empty cells, the browser is not able to detect anymore which cell is actually empty. And since everything has merged, has collapsed into each other and therefore empty cells is also not having any effect anymore. We can remove con um, cells that have no content or in general, we can remove elements that have no content. We can select them and then remove them by using pseudo selectors, which we are introducing next week. So we still need to wait until the beginning of next week until we take a look at an alternative here, what we can actually, how to actually remove empty elements. And uh, however, empty cells is not being applied now anymore since we have collapsed the borders, the cells into each other. A last property now, and that is the only property that is not being inherited, even though still it is being applied on the table itself. And that one is referring to the table, to the layout of the table, exactly what the property already says in its word, table layout. And the default value that's being used here is the value of auto, standing for automatically. And what automatically is referring to, to in, in, in the table is the width of the columns and the width of the table. The width of the columns is defined by the content inside the cells inside the column. And the widest cell, the widest content in the cell will define the column width. So in here, the subheadline in the column two and number three is the widest cell in each of these columns here. And therefore it defines ultimately the width of those columns. 
and the total sum of all the columns together define the width of the table. So let me in, in, insert a little bit more content in, in, in one of those cells here. Let me uh, use uh, this one for example. And now this content, this cell has now increased in width. And since this cell is a, is belongs to this column, the entire column has increased in width. And all the column and the entire table has increased, has increased in width as well. Since the table width is defined by the width of all the columns together. And this is what happens when we are making use of the value of auto in CSS for the table layout property. This is how the, the width, widths of the column and the table will ultimately be defined. Now, this is only the case when we have enough space here still for, for, for the, for the table. Now, let me define some width here since we haven't yet defined any width for a column or for a table. Now let's take a look at the behavior that actually goes on once we do define a width. So let me give the column number two and number three a width of five pixel, which is of course exaggerated small just to give us the example of what actually now happens. Now five pixel is very, very tiny and we can already see with our human eye that this is by far not five pixel in width this column now. It's something like 70 pixel that both of these columns now have. Even though that we have said, hey, we want it to be 5 pixel. And this is not being applied since we are making use of the value auto here. This is the behavior that auto is doing since it will then always ma still make the column width as wide as the largest word which it cannot break into a new line. In between a word or when we are using a hyphen, then it can break, it breaks the word into a new line. However, a single word, it will not break in the middle. So therefore it tries to go down as far as possible to five pixel. But if, but the, the widest word, this is the tiniest, this is the smallest width that it will ultimately go, go down to. The headline, the widest word in this column will define how wide the column will be if we are defining a width smaller than the longest word inside this column. Let me now also give another example. Let me define the width for the entire table to very, very small. Once again, 200 pixel. And again, it will not go down to 200 pixel. Let us just measure this, this uh, table width is something like 280 pixel. And again, the word, the widest word is always the headline here. It defines the column width. Even though that we have given the width of 200 pixel, it will never let any text overflow and it will never break a word in the middle and move it down. Nevertheless, <coughs> it moves text in between words down and therefore ultimately it will also define the height of the table as we can see right here since uh, the cell height has now increased and ultimately the entire height of the table increases as well. So this is what the auto value does. <clears throat> so it's doing quite a nice thing, isn't it? Since most likely we do not want any content inside our cells to overflow. How, uh, however, there is a good, a great disadvantage that this value has, the table layout value auto. And since the width of the column and the width of the table is defined by the content inside the cells, and therefore, the browser first needs to know the entire content of each and every cell inside the table in order to define how wide the columns and how wide the table ultimately will be. And therefore, it will take him a while until he has parsed, read all the entire content inside the cells. In particular, this is the case when we are dealing with a large table. And this will slow the browser down, leading him to, or leading to a slower, slower, process until the website is being being displayed. So this is the disadvantage that this value of auto has and therefore alternatively and what we can use and as recommended should should be used whenever we have a glue approximately how wide the columns shall be in order that the text fits in there then we should go for the value of fixed. Because here what we define in width this will be applied and this in this situation since I have made them very very small 5 pixel content here will of course therefore overflow ultimately. But if we are familiar with, with how wide approximately a column shall be in order that the text fits in there then we should go for this value in particular when we are dealing with a large table 
since it speeds up the process of lo loading our website. So this is fixed. Fixed is according what we define ultimately. And if we do not define anything, so let me just remove those values here once again, then there is still enough space here. The table still has here space. So it will have exactly the same effect as auto. It makes room as much, uh, as much as it can right here, but uh, it will still make room as normal. If I would now, let me give the width back. So in this situation, let me actually increase the width right here, for example, to 300 pixel. It will only consider in when we are making use of the value fixed, it will not consider the content inside each and every cell, but only the content that is inside the first cell on top. That one will ultimately define the width of the table. It will not consider any other cell inside here. So either it's specified exactly how we want it, and if we do not specify anything, then it will only consider the, the first rows and nothing else. Therefore, it does not need to know the content of each and every other cell. Therefore, it will speed up the process in displaying the table and therefore displaying our entire website. So that is the value fixed and the value auto. These are the last two, this is the last property that we have now gone over and now comes the last section of this week where in which we are discussing the display property. Before we go into this one, let's first of all discuss the behaviors of the table once again and also the display property of what values we have gotten familiar with um, so far. Now the table in itself, one more thing that I also want to mention is that margins cannot be applied on neither of those elements, call group, call, head, tier, table, row, table, cell, none of them can have a margin. The only one that can actually have a margin being applied on it is the caption. No other element can have a margin. What happens if we want, nevertheless, if we want a gap in between a cell, for example, if we are dealing with a large table and for example, every 10th row shall have a gap in between so that the table may become a little bit more readable. So if we really want to go for a margin, what we need to do then ultimately is to create a table row and just leave it empty. Another table row and this one we will ultimately give a, give a, oh let me do it in between somewhere. Let me do it right here and uh, just leave it empty and I will now do something that we shouldn't do. Let me just briefly do inline styling and let me give this row a height for example of 20 pixel. Now we have a row in here with 20 pixel and since there are no cells in there, it's just an empty row. This is the alternative what we can do since margin cannot be applied. And margin cannot be applied. So there is a certain behavior going on here for all these elements since they disallow the margin to, to have margin. And there are so many different behaviors going on. The table element, for example, that one is the only one that can have those properties, empty cells, etc. the ones that we have just gone over. Caption, for example, caption is at the top. Nevertheless, it can be at the bottom. So it's working against the normal flow rules completely, completely its own behavior. Call group is not really a representation. It's not really wrapping around a column. It's just indirectly allowing us to select the column. Same as call, completely its own behavior. Table heads, table foot can actually be anywhere here. Table foot can be before the table body. Table body can also be somewhere else, can be before the table foot. Nevertheless, the table foot will always be displayed at the last, in the last row. Also table body will be displayed be before the table head. So things are not really following the normal flow rules here. There are certain, completely certain behaviors that go on here. Table row as well, and in particular table cells. Since table cells, for example, when one, the height, when one table cell increases in height, the highest one will determine the height of all the other cells as well. Completely own behaviors go on here. And all these behaviors are defined by the display property. And so far we have gotten to know the display values block, inline block and inline. And the most important thing now in this last section is to once again understand that, that these are just elements that we are using on our website. These are just elements. How they behave and appear is all defined in CSS. 
These are our text elements. Text elements are by default set to display in line inside the browser default style sheet that the browser is using. Container boxes are by default set to display block. Container boxes are those ones, those that have real content inside it, other container boxes, etc. And for example, another container box would be OL, UL, table in this situation. Or table, yeah, they have differently. They are kind of container boxes, which we find out in a moment. Canvas, for example, is a container box. SVG is a container box. These are container boxes. Paragraph, headlines are container boxes. They are display block by default. Set in the browser default style sheet. And everything else that's not a text element, that's not display in line, that cannot have a width and a height. And, this, and all other things that is not a container box or nor a text element is display inline block. And that includes, for example, video, audio, iframe, all these images. These are display inline block set by the browser in its default style sheet. That does not mean that we cannot change any of those elements from display inline, for example, to display inline block or from display block to display inline block. We can change them all. It's all done in CSS. These are just elements. Dumb elements. Let me call them dumb elements. They have meaning. We create them in order that we have meaning on our website. And some of them do have properties that can only be given to them. Uh, sorry, um, um, attributes that can only be given to them. For example, co span or row span. But otherwise, all the settings, how they behave is done in CSS. And it's just the browser that does this by default in his style sheet. It's all defined in CSS and all the table boxes, how they behave, is also defined in CSS using the display property. For example, the table is behaving like it is behaving and the table can only be the one that can get these, these properties because by default it is being set to display table. Let's take a look at the table. First of all, the first difference from display table to any other value is that the table and only the table, the display table, uh, can have the, the properties that are right here. And it's not the case that these properties can be applied because this is the element that's name is table. The actual reason is because this element has been set to display table. Therefore, these properties can be applied and not because that's his name table. It's the display property that defines it. So let's take a look at the table and let me insert a little bit of text after the table to in order to see another effect that the table actually has. Text is just an inline inline content. So it could be next to it when there is enough space and there is enough space, but nevertheless, it's underneath. So it's kind of behaving this table like a block element since it does not allow anything to be next to it since it is occupying indirectly the entire line in which it is in irrespective of the width that it has and therefore whatever comes afterwards has to move into the next line like our text. So if, however, it's not display table width. Let me remove the width of the table and we know if this table would be display block then block elements by default are as wide as their parent going until here. But this table is not going until here, so it's not really display block. This is a feature completely. It's a table behavior that's going on here that's only referring to table. In addition to this, only display table elements can have those properties being applied to them. So if we want anything to be next to a table, all we need to do is we need to change the value which is given to the table element by default display table we can change it to display inline table so now it is an inline element but still it is behaving like a table element meaning it can still have those properties border collapse empty cells border spacing apply to it if we change this now to display inline block then border collapse empty cells could not be applied to this element anymore so it still shall be a table, behave like a table, but on an inline level so that there can be other inline content next to it as soon as, as long as there is enough space for that inline content to be right here. So completely they have their own behavior. And what I have now created in order for us just to get familiar with those values that actually go on here, 
I have created another table just by using div elements. Since we can make div elements to behave like tables, since everything is defined in the display property. So all we need to do here in this situation is, I have here a div element that, that I have given a class, a class value of table. This element shall act like the table. So all we need to do in this situation is let me go down to the actual code that I have already, that I have already created here, the, the div element with the class table. All we need to do, hey, we want it to be a table, to act like a table. So all we need to do, display table. And then we can apply the border collapse, caption site, and all the, the properties we can apply on this element, even though it's a div, since all is defined in the display property why we can use those properties here. This is the reason. Display table and display inline table elements can make use of them. So what I have here right now are just still div elements. We still need to define all the other things. Here is another div element which I have used table caption. I've given it a class table caption. And this div element shall act like table caption. So it shall, can be at the bottom but, can, but is always listed at the top. Now next one, for example, all of them have its own behavior. Call group, for example, call elements. They do not really represent, they um, wrap columns inside, but indirectly they represent them anyhow. So what is leading to that behavior is the value display table column group. For the call element, it's display table column. Then also the t head element, as discussed, the t body element, the t head, the t foot, completely they have their own behavior, which is defined by the property, by the display property with the value table header group. That's for the T head element. The T foot element is by default set to table footer group, which gives him its behavior. The body, T body element is by default set to ta display table row group in the browser default style sheet, which ultimately gives him the behavior, how it is behaving. Table rows are set to display table row and cells, whether they are TH or TD elements, they are both set to display table cell. Most of these values, we completely do not need to learn them now, since they, we never use them apart from inside tables, and those table elements do already have those settings applied to them inside the browser default style sheet. So we don't need to worry. The point here is that I want to bring across that once again, that everything is defined in CSS, how the, the elements behave. So generally we could use div elements since all we need to do is then set the display property on them that makes them act like a table. So we could create a table by using div elements. However, this is just wrong. We shouldn't go for this option. First of all, it's much easier to create tables using the elements since the display values are already automatically given to them in the default style sheet by the browser. Secondly, and that is most importantly, this is against accessibility, against the meaning that we should always have on our website. This table is not really a table. We have created diff elements using this table. This one is a table here, one created with meaningful table elements. So we should not create a table using diff elements. That is the major reason. Another one is that we cannot really make use of the attributes such as call span, row span, for example. Since we are now dealing with div elements and those row span, call span attributes are specific to the TD and the TH elements. So tables are created using the table elements, of course, but to bring across here the settings, how they ultimately behave are all done in CSS. And this is the same also for list, for the lists, which I forgot to mention last week. So the ordered and the unordered list, they are behaving in a certain way. For example, there are a couple of properties that can only be given to ordered and unordered list elements that behave like that. And it's not the element that makes them behave like they are. It's once again, it's the display property. And the value that's being in use here is list item that's being set automatically by the browser on the OL and the UL element, which makes them behave like ordered and unordered lists. It's this value inside for the display property. So what I have now created here um, also is now 
two layouts and one layout I have created by using table elements, the other layout I have used by using div elements. And we want both of those layouts to have table behavior. Behavior like table rows, like tables and like table cells. So let's take a look at this code here. So here is a table element. Oh, let's first of all actually take a look uh, at the result here. I have created two times the same layout. And this is just in small. We have to assume this could be our entire website layout. For example, this is the column for our navigation. This is our main container box. And here would be some aside information. And this one, they are acting like table cells. So all of them, this one is one row inside here with three individual cells. What I have created here, a row with one cell, one cell and one cell. This one shall be the navigation, the main container and here shall be another cell. Inside the main container, I have created another table container, another table in here, in order that I can now provide here two other table rows and then in each row there will be another, another um, cell. So these boxes, all these boxes here are acting like table cells. And in the other one, these ones are also acting like table cells, even though I have used div elements, but I have set them to display table cell. So they are also now acting like table cells. It's the exact layout. One I have used the table elements for, where the display values are already being applied. Display table cell, display table row, etc. And for the div elements, I had to um, apply them now myself, since by default the div inside the browser default style sheet are set to display block, not to display table cell. Now, what should we use here if we create layouts? And now it's exactly the opposite. This is wrong. We are telling here, actually, we are telling the site disabled people and the search engine robots, hey, this is a table, even though this is not a table. This is our actual website. This is the navigation. This is the main container. This is the aside container box. This is wrong. So when we create layouts with the behavior of table cells, then we need to go for diff elements in this case. So this is the correct solution in this case. The exact opposite when we are dealing with tables, actual tables, then we need to create them by using table elements and not diff elements. Nowadays, we wouldn't create the entire layout of our website using table elements anymore. However, back in the days, websites were created by using table layouts since the web has not evolved so much with uh, other layout options such as inline block block. Nowadays, it's not the case that we would create them using um, table features such as table cells. We wouldn't set those boxes to display table cells. However, there are Three situations which I briefly want to mention why people out there have and may still be using the behavior of table cells. And this is where we are now finishing up with those three examples. And I want to all already mention there are always alternatives which I personally, that comes down to a preference thing, that I personally do prefer the alternatives. However, it comes down to a preference thing. So if we are going to what I prefer personally, then we ultimately don't need to worry about any of those values, display table cell, any of those, since when we create tables, they are already applied to the table cells and all these features by the browser default style sheet. However, when we are creating, when we make use of them for some features, then we need to familiar, need to be familiar at least with display table cell with a display table row and display table in general. And display inline table is quite relevant to those four. So let's go over um, those examples. And one example would be what we have here right now and what we, how we create our, um, our layout very often. In this case, I'm having a two column layout. So I create one box, first of all, that represents both of the boxes going all the way down here. And in here are two other boxes, which is in this case, the first column representing the navigation, which only end, which ends right here. And then the other box, which goes all the way down. And if we want that navigation to be as high as the other box here, however high that one is, 
then we can make them behave. Both of these boxes which are next to each other, which we have for now set to display inline block, we can set them to display table cell and then they will always be next to each other. They will always have the same height. This is one reason why things were used back in those days. And also nowadays can still be used. First of all, let me go for an alternative. The main container box that, that includes this container box and this one, we have given a back, or it's been given a background color of yellow. So we can kind of fake it, first of all. And that is, might be a good solution too sometimes. So let me just give the main container, which is still sticking out here, since the aside is ending right here, still sticking out. Let me give that one a background color of this one. So we are faking it kind of. All we have given is the main element that is the parent of both of these boxes that are next to each other, the navigation and the light blue one. That one I have now given the exact same background color as the navigation. And therefore it will kind of look like that the navigation container box is going all the way down. Even though it's still ending, it's still ending right here, but it's kind of a, a trick, a faked, faked solution that we can go for. This one, however, we cannot always use depending on the situation situation so what i have here also is a main container box and inside this main container box there are individual other boxes however there is always a gap in between and if i would give the main container box a background color that would mean that this background color would be visible in between these boxes and therefore the background image would not come come through here anymore this of course would not look good so this fake solution we could not always go for so here, for example, we could go for table cells. And this one has the highest content. Therefore, this one is the highest element on this one. Therefore, determines all the other, all the other columns, boxes, height as well. They will always be the same height. I have used the flex layout here for this one, which I personally do prefer. However, this is, we can go for table cells. So let's uh, take a look at this one. First of all, let me change it back to uh, the original so we can see the ultimate result so here is yellow again the box is still ending right here and now let me change it to from display inline block this box and this box to display table cell and we should always define who's the table which is the parent element the main we should always define as well so let me make that one display table so these are the table cells um, so that we have always the behavior of a table, we should set the parent to display table. And the children, the main element, the yellow one is display table, and the two children that are inside it, this one and the light blue one, are now behaving like table cells and going all the way down this one here, going all the way until the end. Now this one is not as wide. Something, uh, this one is because I have misspelled here, display table. Now it's going all the way. So we should always define display table on the parent if we are making use of that feature display table cell. Otherwise it will not give us the complete table behavior that tables have. Another example that I want to bring across and once again I myself prefer the alternative. And that is when we want our column right here to have a certain width, a fixed width, while the, the, the box next to it shall have a flexible width in percentages. And this one in pixel, fixed in, in pixel. I have made all the elements already in, in percentages now, which we are heading towards later in a couple of weeks. One of the, that's the last week actually. So that this one now both is decreasing in width here since I have both given them percentage values. So they are decreasing when the browser window is decreasing meaning when for example a person is using a mobile phone then this is how the website ultimately looks like so both of these columns are decreasing however when this one shall be fixed only this one shall be flexible what we can do also here is we can just set hey fixed table layout shall be fixed and therefore we can now give the aside column let me give it a a width fixed width of 300 pixel now the other one we can remove since the remaining part will be taken up already. And now let me decrease. Only now this one is decreasing. The other one will always stay at 300 pixel. Let me go for the alternative solution, which I personally prefer as well. So I myself, I am never using table layouts anymore. Nevertheless, let me briefly go over it. 
and that is let me uncomment that one again let me go back to display inline block and therefore let me remove table layout table and display property here so all I we can do here is we can define nevertheless the aside column shell 300 pixel this one 300 pixel and the main column the the other box next to it shall have a flexible width using the calculation function which we have already made use of so let me give 100 percent minus 300 pixels let me save it and it will lead to the exact same result that's the alternative solution which i personally once again prefer now the calculation function and the flex which is the alternative solution to making display table cell to our first example both of them were not supported by earlier versions of Internet Explorer and also other browsers. So these we nowadays can use. And therefore nowadays myself I do not make use of table cells etc. All these kind of display table behavior settings anymore. So jump, just something to for us to, to um, get familiar to take a look at. In particular when we are dealing with a website that somebody else has written in the past. And we need, then, then we know, ah, this is how he has accomplished things, he or she. So nevertheless, it's completely it comes down to a preference. My, I myself do not make use of them anymore. Last example to finish up now is a behavior that tables do also have. And some people out there do use it in order to center an inline level element. Let me reload the page. So what I have created here is just a box in which there is another box and if we want that in that's inline block level this box and if we want to get that to the center one option we actually have already seen is let, let's go for that option we can go for line height set it to the exact same height as the height and this would make the text to be centered but since this is text the baseline is right here text would be the baseline is always there where the text would be right in the center then However, this one is a box quite high. It's still on the baseline. In order to get it to the middle, we need to apply a vertical align, which is not an inherited property. Therefore, it must be applied on that orange box itself. So let me give it vertical align middle, and then it will be in the middle of the box. So this is can be done in order to center inline level elements since this orange box is an inline level inline block i have given it alternatively and this is completely again once again specific to table cells if we make that gray box to behave like a table cell so i have also created a parent in which in which this box is inside which i give display table now now we can center it also by using vertical align but this time it's on the gray box on the table cell itself it has its own behavior and let me reload the display let me reload the page and it is not being centered display table this one is uh, yeah of course because i'm still using line height we don't need to use line height anymore then and vertical align is not applied on the orange box but on the cell then and it, this will also cause the box to be centered so this is also a behavior that browsers do here we can see it maybe and no right now not cells right here we can see it this one it's centered in the middle always the text inside the cell this is completely a behavior for cells on its own i i'm not using this feature still not so i'm not personally not using all these table layout features there are always alternatives Completely a preference thing up to us ultimately. And this is it. So this was quite a long week <coughs> in <coughs> where we discussed tables. Just a, a last comment. Next week we will be discussing um, the pseudo selectors by which we, for example, can also select in the individual columns of a table. And we can also remove empty cells. And we will also be going into shapes, creating triangles, etc. So this is what's coming next week.